Hello, Maggie. How are you today? Glad to see you. All right, since you're here, Maggie, let us go ahead and get started with a prayer. God, our Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for allowing us to come together this evening. We thank you for your time. We thank you for your, um, your love. We thank you for your grace and mercy. Father, we ask that you open our hearts and minds to learn tonight more of you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, as you can see... <clears throat> The subject matter is the Book of Jubilees, and we are talking about um, books that were found between 1947 and 1956, 15 copies of that was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls in an area of the world called Quram. Call it Quran. Um, Fifteen scrolls that consist of about 50 chapters. That is second in the discovery finding only to the book of Psalms, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Exodus, and Genesis, and far greater than any other books that were found, including the book of Enoch. This is also known as the Little Genesis, Book of Divisions, or the Apocalypse of Moses. The Book of Jubilees is the apocryphal book, meaning that it is not accepted as scripture, and the historians believe it was delivered to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. And it's almost, it was lost for about a thousand years or so, but it was retrieved from the Ethiopic language. It reinterprets the contents of Genesis 1 through Exodus 12. According to some scholars, Genesis 1 to Exodus 15, 22, or Exodus 16, which is in range in the period of 49 years, 49 periods consisting of 49 years each, which form the Jubilee of Jubilees. So 49 years is equal to a Jubilee. And you can find that in your Bible in Leviticus 25, 8 through 13. Okay? So it gives us additional details about the fall of the angels and the creation and destruction of the Nephilim, the Nephilim detailing one-tenth of that disembodied spirits will stay on earth as demons 
to tempt people and the rest of the world would be in prison until the tribulation period. You have any questions so far? All right. The original Hebrew text survives only in fragments found in the Dead Sea Scroll at Quran. Up until their discovery, the last the work was only known from the Ethiopic translations of the whole and incomplete and incomplete versions in Latin and Syriac. The fact that the surviving Hebrew fragments are from twelve different caves indicate the book enjoyed considerable popularity among the Quran community. Now, let's uh, learn about who the Qumran are. Qumran, the Qumran was a um, community of Jewish. Hello, Sister Elizabeth, how are you doing? Glad you could join us. Let me give you a quick recap of what we covered so far to bring you up to speed. Between 1947 and 1956, approximately 15 copies of the Book of Jubilees were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that's second only to Jub um, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. That is all good. Second only to Deuteronomy, um, Psalms, Isaiah, Exodus, and Genesis. Genesis is more books than any other extra biblical text found, including the book of Enoch. It's also called the Little Genesis, Book of Divisions, of the Apocalypse of Moses. The Book of Jubilee is an apocryphal, apocryphal book not accepted as scripture. Um, which historians believe was delivered to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. It's all, it was also lost for over a thousand years, um, but retrieved from the Ethiopic language. It reinterprets the contents of Genesis 1 through Exodus 12, or some scholars between believe Exodus, Genesis 1 through Exodus 15, 22, or Exodus 16. Which were and the periods are arranged in 49, 49 year periods, which is uh, forms of jubilee, and you'll find that in um, Leviticus 25, 8 through 15. It gives additional e details about the fall of the angels, the creation and destruction of the nerfin, that uh, one tenth of the disembodied spirits would stay on earth as demons and tempt people, and the rest would be in prison until tribulation period. All right. So the uh, additional, the original Hebrew text only had fragments found in the Dead Sea Scrolls at Quran. Up until their discovery, 
the work was known only from the Ethiopic translations of the whole and incomplete versions in Latin and Syriac. The fact that the surviving Hebrew fragments are found at least in at least 12 different caves means that um, it was kind of popular in that community at that time. Now, a little bit about that community. Before we do that, let's back up. 15 scrolls consist of about 50 chapters, 50 chapters that covers that uh, period from there. Now, the Quorum, Quorum, Q-U-M-R-A-N, was a, was a community of Jewish ascetics. They were called Essenes. And they were devoted to, they devoted their lives to writing and preserving sacred texts. They had, they were hard at work the time Jesus began preaching. Ultimately, they stored the uh, scrolls in 15 caves, 11 caves, before the Romans destroyed their settlement in um, AD 68. So their tribe or their name itself is the Essenes. And they hid the uh, scrolls in 11 caves. Now, what does that mean? What is the meaning of their name? It's an archaeological site on the west bank in, um, in that area. And it was known as a settlement nearest to the caves where all those scrolls were found or were hidden. And in the sh sheer cliffs of the desert and beneath the Mari of the Terrace. Okay? Now... About these people in particular, the Essenes were like Pharisees. They meticulously observed the law of Moses, the Sabbath, and ritual purity. They also professed to believe in immor uh, immortality, divine punishment for sin. But unlike the Pharisees, they denied resurrection of the body and refused to, Im to immerse themselves in public life. So, they were very secretive people. They stayed within themselves, and but they were very meticulous about observing the law and writing down everything that they got. Okay? You with me so far? Amen. How you doing, Sister Sue? Y'all with me so far? All right. Look at the quotation on top. The quotation on top, uh, quotations for Jubilees were found within the documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which verified that it was an early pre-Christian document. There has been some speculation that these books, the Book of Enoch and Jubilees, were intentionally obscured, obscured by Satan in an attempt to, to hide his methods of operation and the true identity of evil spirits. So, how do you stop a person, how do you stop a group of people from learning or knowing who they truly are? You hide their identity. Or you hide your identity and you can feed them whatever it is you want to feed them and they learn what you want them to learn. And that's what um, Dr. Dr. Dale Sides believes is what happened when they, um, the scrolls were hidden and lost for over a thousand years. So when they were finally discovered, rediscovered, and between 1956 and between 1947 and 1956, they were brought into pop, not popularity, but they were brought to public attention. And of course, you know, there's been a lot of debate of whether or not they're actual real or what, or not. Okay. The author of the Dead Sea Scrolls is believed to have been familiar with, is unknown. But it's familiar with Mosaic law, most likely a most like a Pharisaical priest, and has the main purpose to instruct on altering the regulation of the lunar calendar and festivals more suitable for the solar calendar of 12 months that contains 364 days. The system that would cause all festivals except for Yom Kippur to fall on Sunday, a drastic idea for today's time. Keep it in mind, the calendar that they had, uh, the original calendar, if you read the book, when you read the book of Enoch and you start to look into the book of um, 
Jubilees, you'll find that originally the time frame was 364 days. It was not 365 days. The time frame changed as we went along and we got from, went from the Jew, Jewish calendars to the Gregorian calendars. There's two Jewish calendars, the pre-flood calendar and the post-flood calendar. The pre-flood calendar will indicate that, uh, will show that when Adam was created, it would be around the fall time when the harvest would take place because Adam went into the gar garden and began the harvesting. The new calendar, well, the second Hebrew calendar, comes about um, after, the, after the flood when the ark landed and the world began again. Coincidentally, not coincidentally, it was God's divine plan. That was the same time during which, if we pay attention, spring begins around mid-March through April, and the same time we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, all that all goes coinciding together into the time frame of what um, of what God had in mind after the flood. Okay? Now, let's look at um, some other things that we're going to learn about as we go into go into the book and start to get serious about it. There's four classes of angels that are talked about. Angels of presence, angels of sanctification, angels, guardian angels over individuals, and angels presiding over the phenomenon of nature. Now, the highest classes of angels are the angel of pre angels of presence and the angels of sanctification. Okay? The four angels that are named, four archangels that are named as the angels of presence are Archangel Michael, Archangel uh, Raphael, Archangel Uriel, and Archangel Gabriel. Archangel Michael, as you know, is the warrior angel, the angel of protection. Um, Raphael, Archangel Raphael, is the healing angel. He is responsible for healing the mind, body, and the spirit. Archangel Uriel is God, light of God. When you have a vision or when you see something coming, your intuition is triggered. That's Archangel Uriel. He's giving you a visual foresight into what's coming your direction. And then Archangel Gabriel, strength of God. He delivers important messages or he gives uh, the announcement of Jesus Christ being born and all the other announcements that he made in the uh, Bible. Um, and then he's also instrumental in helping us choose our words, choosing the right words when we need to speak on certain things. Okay? Now, the angels, uh, archangels of sanctification were created on the first day of creation. Now, there's another archangel that's included in there, but he's included because he was the first one created from human beings, and that would be Metatron. Metatron is an archangel, the keeper of the book. That is Enoch, who was translated, walked with God and was no more. He was the first angel, first archangel that was created for man. The second archangel that was a man that became an angel was Elias. His name is Sandifer. He is the archangel of music, poetry, and the arts. Okay? So, if you go to Luke 2 and 36, and, oh, that's not what I want, Genesis 32 and 30, it talks about Archangel Phinea. That's the face of God. Okay? That's what his name means, the face of God. And that's where you will find information on him. Now, let's take a walk, a preview into uh, Jubilees 2, and that would tell us a little bit about the creation and those angels of presence. And the angel's presence and the angel of presence spoke to Moses according to the word of the Lord, saying, Write the complete history of creation. 
how in six days the Lord God finished all his works and all that he created and kept the Sabbath on the seventh day and hallowed it for all ages and appointed it as a sign for all his works. Verse 2. For on the first day he created the heavens which was one of which are above the earth, which are above, and the earth and the waters and all the spirits which serve him, the angels of presence and the angels of sanctification, and the angels of spirit of fire, and the angels of the spirit of fire, and the spirit of the winds, and the spirit and the angels of the spirit of the clouds, and of darkness, and of snow, and of hail, and of hoarfrost, and the angels of voices, and the thunder and of the thunder and of lightning and the angels of spirit of coal and of heat and of winter and of spring and of autumn and uh, of summer and all the spirits of his creatures which are in the heavens and on the earth he created the abyss the darkness the eventide and night and the light dawn day and he had prepared that knowledge in his heart Thereupon he saw his work and praised him, and he lauded before the Lord an account of all his works for seven great works he did create on the on the first day. Okay, so that gets us a head start or a preview into um, what's coming. Like I said, tonight is just an introduction into the book of um, into the book of Jubilees. That's an introduction, getting us started. Um, as we continue, we already talked about uh, Enoch. He was being Enoch was the first man that the angels taught about writing, and Enoch wrote several books: Enoch one, Enoch two, and Enoch three. Um, he wrote about the secrets of uh, astronomy, the chronology, and of the um, world's epochs. In regards to demonology, the writer's position is largely Deuteronomy writings from the Old and New Testaments. Okay? Now, this book narrates the genesis of angels on the first day of creation. We already talked about how the angels were created and where they were at the time of um, the beginning. So now, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a quick post for you to look at. You get a chance to look at it. We're gonna talk about the origin of demons. And then we're gonna wrap up for the evening if you have, unless you have some questions. Like I said, this is just a, a preview to what's coming and we'll go more in depth Okay, that link will take you to an article entitled um, Principalities, Powers, and Demons. Their Differences, Their, or their Origins, and Our Authority Over Them. And that's by uh, Dale M. Sides, Dr. Dale Sides. All right, so before we get into the, in depth, into the, um, origin of angels, we have to look at the fact that the book of Jubilees and Enoch were looked at or were talked about by the apostle Peter and Jude. And Jude in uh, Peter 2, 2 Peter 2 and 4, he's talking about the angels that were locked away in Tartarus or the um, the rebel, the rebellious angels that were put in captivity until uh, time, until end times, okay? Then in the book of Jude, there's a direct quote, um, Jude 14, where he's talking about, and I mentioned this in the sermon a couple weeks ago, where he was talking about 
how they got there and where they were. Okay, so June 14 is one reference point, and Second Peter. Two four is your other reference point for dealing with um, demons. Nah, no sermon. No sermon. Just teaching. Please participate. Okay, so that'll get you started into where you're going. So now, when you look at, if you get a chance while we're online to look at those uh, those scriptures that I gave you, that'd be great. Now, before I go further, we'll go ahead and um, give you what Dr. Sai said. The Ethiopian Jews had always included Enoch one along with Jubilees and three and three and four in Ezra in his canon of the scriptures. But many scholars simply pass Enoch off as a post Christian apocryphal book and categorized as a Gnostic text. Yet when complete copies of Enoch were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which had been preserved and packed away before the birth of Christ, the scholars were forced to take another look at it. Through the facts though the facts in uh, Enoch are noteworthy, especially since Jude 14 quotes Enoch, giving it greatest credibility whenever Jesus alludes to it, the significance of further consideration increases dramatically, okay? So once Jesus talked about it, now it's verified that, yes, this did take place, and yes, we know what happened, and this is what's going on. Um, we're, going to go, we're going to see that the book of Jubilees provides great detail and some points greater specifics than the book of Enoch concerning the origin of demons. Okay? Quotations from Jubilees were found within the documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which verify that it was also an early pre-Christian document. The Jubilee quotations give even more credibility to Enoch 1 and therefore to the uh, Ethiopic canon of scriptures that had been previously considered. If you're not familiar, the, Ethiopians can, um, the Ethiopian Bible has the Book of Enoch within it. The Bibles in the Western culture don't have it. The Book of Enoch is included in the Ethiopian Bible. Okay. Now, there have been some speculation that these books were intentionally, go back up to this quote, that quote there, the books were intentionally obscured from the um, Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, this suggestion must be considered since one Enoch and the Jubilees held much greater suspicion before the discovery of the second, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Before the discovery, you know, it was there was a lot of question about the validity or whether these books really were worthwhile. So now the recovery is the evidence within the Dead Sea Scrolls establishing the pre-Christian validity. In other words, these books existed before Christ. And they, if you have not read the book of Enoch, the book of Enoch kind of speaks about the whole Bible. It foretells everything in the Bible from the dates and everything else, okay? Now, when we get to looking in the book of Enoch, their discovery among the uh, other manuscripts such as the rules of war, war rules from the Dead Sea Scrolls give a greater weight to the possibility that they were intentionally hidden, okay? that they were intentionally hidden by Satan so we would not know his methods of operation and the identity of who the evil spirits are. Keep in mind now, keep in mind, principalities and powers exist. Principalities and powers exist. And we go back to the Greek word arche, that means they've existed since the beginning of time. In other words, those were those rebellious sons of God that were eventually cast out of heaven. But they still live and still live within the heavenly realms. Now, demons, 
when you go to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, the giants, the Nerephim, when they drowned, one-tenth of those spirits were left on earth while the other 90% were locked in captivity. Those spirits are earthbound. Demons do not have the same, same power, if you would, as the principalities and powers. Okay? Mm -hmm. Demons are earthbound. Demons need a body on earth to lay dormant in, some place to hide, and, and in order for them to be in existence. Whereas the powers and the principalities can only come in when we invite them in. Okay? The, um, and being legalistic, being legalistic, like the Holy Spirit come in when we invite them in, no, help, no heavenly being can occupy earth with out our permission to be within us. Okay? All right. Now, this not by any means is an argument designed to confer that these books are the authority equal to be more commonly accepted canon of the scripture. Although the decision by which the books were would be included made somewhat arbitrarily by Gentile scholars. The Bible was put together, I want to say it was the Council of Nicene, when they put the, um, together Constantine was the uh, emperor or the king that oversaw that taking place. And they chose what they wanted to put into the Bible and what not to put into the Bible. Okay? All right. When talking about the book of Enoch, if it bothers some people, it, it, that you take up that matter with Jesus, Jew, Peter, the Ethiopian Jews, and the host of recognized scholars around the world. But Jesus did quote the book of Enoch. We know where we can find it uh, in the book of Jude and Peter where they was quoted. So that's been around for a while. Enoch and the Jubilees, Jubilees chronicle events before the flood at the time of Noah, supplying the documentation for particular sources and cross-referencing the Bibles. Okay? Now, Here's a word for you. And we're going to talk about this word later. We're going to get more in detail in it. We talk about the watchers. Okay? The watchers is a category of good angels. And you'll find that scripture in Daniel 4, 13, 17, and verse 23. Well, I guess I should put Daniel in there so you know what you're looking for. Daniel. All right. Their job was basically to oversee um, and teach men on earth. They were called the sons of God. And they were put here to oversee what was going on on earth. Um, the book of Jubilees is in the fourth chapter in the 15th verse. They were assigned to earth and they were given bodies. Okay? The watchers became enthralled with the beauty of earthly women. Thus, we had the giants born. Okay? They're referred to as Nephilim. And then there's up two other classes of giants that were descendant of the Nephilim, the Anakims and the Raphaims. The Raphaims, the last, the smallest of the three, was Goliath and his clan. Okay? Now, they caused man on earth, and it grieved God that he made man. That's Genesis 6, 6 and 7, okay? Incidentally, if it grieved God that he made man, it indicates that something had happened that wasn't supposed to happen in his initial plans. It's logical to assume that evil, can't, evil was the result of operations of free will instead of God's intention. God knew what was going to happen. He's all-knowing. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that the angels were going to rebel and do what they did. You have a question. Was, it, was Enoch before Christ? Yes, Enoch was before Christ. Enoch was Methuselah's father. Enoch walked with God and was no more. He's in the book of uh, Genesis. Enoch walked with God and was no more. And I believe when he walked with God, he was somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 900 years old, Pastor? 
three hundred. No, Eli. But those were the nine hundred. Yeah, no, he walked with God th three hundred. He was three hundred years old. Three hundred plus years. Three hundred. Matter of 300 fact, three hundred sixty-five. He was 365 years old when he walked with God no more. Methuselah was his son, lived to be 900 years old. And Methuselah's name means uh, I know his name. His name means it has to do with the flood and death coming. So when, his, when Methuselah died, that was the time for the flood to come. If you keep in mind, Methuselah was Noah's is also in Noah's blood uh, bloodline. So once Methuselah died, that means the cleansing of the earth could come. Okay? Sorry to get off track. Alright. So the book of the Enoch also offers an explanation of the connection between the watchers and Satan. Because Satan knew the prophecy that the seed of a woman would eventually crush his head, Genesis three fifteen. It was predictable that Satan would try to corrupt the woman's lineage in order to prevent the coming of Christ. So if just corruption of the lineage, if I mess up everything that's going on on earth, now this is going to prevent Jesus from coming, which means I get to live a whole lot longer. It's not going to, he knew he couldn't defeat him, but his whole goal was to delay Jesus' coming as long as he could. Even today, the powers and principalities know they're not going to win, but they do everything they can to keep us delayed until the second coming of Christ. Okay? Amen. All right. This is perfect parallel to Satan's tactics to tempt the watchers with disobedience in order to corrupt the bloodline of the potential Messiah, of the Messiah, therefore preventing the fulfillment of the prophecy. Prophecy. The book of Enoch relates to the watchers that the watch relates that the watchers became messengers of Satan working with him to corrupt mankind. Any questions about that so far? All right. On account of the, of the watchers' oppressive deeds, which they performed as messengers of Satan, leading them astray, they dwelt on they dwelt they dealt on earth. For the sin of corrupting the flesh of men, God punished the disobedient angels by chaining them in Tartarus until the final judgment. That's where you will find, that's the um, 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude 14, Jubilees 5, 2, Enoch 1, Enoch 10, 1. And he proceeded to drown the giants and at the provocation of the obedient angels. All right? Any questions? All right. So now, that's to get us a good jump start into where we're going. And next week, we'll start looking more deeply into the creation. Now that we have a foundation of what the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees is, and what the Book of Jubilee isn't, we can start to look at Scripture, and we can start comparing, um, filling in the gaps, if you would, of what the Bible says, and then the continuation of the interpretation by the book of Jubilees. Any other questions? So next week, we will look at the, uh, we'll go back to the beginning. We'll look at the, um, creation of earth, the creation of man, and the fall of man. So we'll be going to the Garden of Eden next week. All right? Next Monday, 6 o'clock. Looking forward to seeing you all here. And this was kind of fun. Amen. Because um, I was so excited about doing this tonight, I locked my keys in my truck I in the ignition. Bing, bing, no luck. <laughs> So I was really excited about doing this tonight. And I'm glad that you all made it. Please tell somebody so that we can um, continue to grow and continue to learn. Uh, remember, the book of Timothy says, study to show yourself approved. Amen. Um, and we also know that the rejection of knowledge is a sin. And God does not want us to reject knowledge because when we reject knowledge, 
we're rejecting him. So we'll pick up Monday at 6 o'clock. Let us have a prayer, and we'll call it a night. God, our Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. We thank you for your word going for forth. We thank you for touching our heart, soul, and mind, and expanding our minds and our knowledge. In the name of Jesus, we ask you to bless each and every household represented here tonight. Watch over us and keep us as we go forth. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen.